I am so glad you convinced me that the family car should be the Defender 110. It is so beautiful inside. It's so comfortable. And it just feels indestructible. Yes, it really is. I've been waiting a long time for the new model to come out. The Defender 110, I'm telling you, it's my favorite car of all times. It's my third one. You know, I have stories of going off road. The guy managed the group. He was like, what are you doing in this beautiful car? I'm like, I'm going off road. He's like, are you sure? Because you can use one of ours. And then they look like Mad Max cars. I'm like, no, 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 no. We're going to do this. And he was shocked. Wow. Well, it's great because the Defender has been reimagined for 21st century adventure and its unparalleled off-road ability as well as its robust interior are invaluable whether you're headed towards uncharted territory or just a weekend of exploration. The Defender 110 tackles challenging surroundings with absolute confidence. The SUV conveys strength outside and in, featuring peerless technology like an intuitive driver display and an award-winning infotainment system. That's my favorite part, to keep you connected no matter where the journey takes you. Adventure is unique to everyone, and so is the Defender. Choose from the two-door Defender 90, the four-door Defender 110, or the larger Defender 130 with the ability to seat up to eight passengers. You'll find uncompromising performance in all three. So pack up and go even further with the Defender 110. Learn more at LandRoverUSA.com forward slash Defender. These days, we're all investors. Trying to be smart with our money despite our worst impulses. But at iShares, we believe that deep down inside of every investor is a better investor. One that's just waiting to be let out. Explore iShares ETFs and insights and let your best investor out. Visit iShares.com for more information. This isn't your average business podcast, and he's not your average host. This is the James Altucher Show. So, Jay, I have made many, many bad decisions in my life. And I've made some good ones. And overall, I think it's worked out. But no one's going to make 100% correct decisions. No one's going to make 100% bad decisions. But you have to have some methodology or model for making many of the decisions in your life or else you're just going to be sitting around deciding things right. most of the time. Right. And so I wanted to talk about my decision-making process in a variety of situations. But I know when we first discussed this, you said you had some questions about decision-making. Yeah, like because I remember this is when I was really young. I was like, got to be 17, 18. I was dating a girl then. You were dating a girl when you were 17? Yeah, dude. Everyone started dating around like 17, 18. I think in, now it's like… In Malaysia? In Malaysia, yeah. I did not have my first girlfriend until I was almost 19 years old. No. Yeah. I always wanted a girlfriend from seventh grade on, but I didn't really have what it takes. So I didn't start dating someone until I was almost 19. I think I started dating when I was 13, 14. But, oh, it, but it's like a popular love. Advanced. They call it popular love. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, yeah. At 17, 18, I was dating this girl. And believe it or not, I, was, I used to run a choir. I used to be in a choir. And then I used to, like the president of the choir club that she founded. But... You know, I'm like, I don't know if I would be, you know, qualified because I'm very bad at decision making because I try to make. What do you mean? You're great at decision making. You decided to work for the best podcast ever. And yeah. you became the podcast producer, the, the producer of that podcast. After 20 years, after, I mean, like 10 years, actually, after 10 years, uh, after, actually, after I worked for you for, I think I recorded five episodes in and then I decided, okay, I want to work for you since then. But back then, She's like, she's like this very controlled woman. She's like sort of manipulative, but you know, that's, that's another story. And she's like, what do you mean by you don't know how to de decide, how to make a decision? Just make whatever decisions and deal with it after. I'm like, I don't know if that's a good or a bad advice. That might be a good advice. Before I talk about that, I actually want to briefly talk about something completely unrelated. <laughs> okay. Which is this theory that I just read about this morning that somehow Donald Trump is a time traveler. Okay, okay. I heard about it when Have he you was heard president. About it? Yep, I heard about it four years ago. 
Four years ago. Yeah. Okay. Right. Because in 2017, I had never heard about this till yesterday, but in 2017, apparently a bunch of people started talking about how, so there was, so, and I realized this yesterday, someone sent me a text of a book, <laughs> right. a book called the, the Adventures of Little Baron Trump. Yep. But the book was written in like 1889. Yep. So, and there's another book, The Marvelous Underground Journey of Baron Trump. And so apparently this guy, Ingersoll Lockwood, he was born in 1841, died in 1918, was a real person, was like an ambassador appointed by Abraham Lincoln, for instance. He, he was, you know, a diplomat. He was a writer. He was a lawyer. It was all, it was all these things. And he wrote this book that was kind of like, you know, supposed to be like Alice in Wonderland, right. but it was about this character, Bar this Baron, little Baron kid, Trump. Baron Trump, who was the son of some rich person. And he would go on all these like amazing adventures and until eventually he would go home to Castle Trump, which AKA Trump Tower. Yeah. And, and then the next book that Ingersoll Lockwood wrote was called The Last President. And he wrote this book again in the 1890s. And it was about the year 1896. On November 3rd, there would be an election. And essentially it's about Americans are really upset. They think that the presidential election process had been corrupted and that some a fake president had been elected and the president lives in New York City and people start rioting in New York City because everybody's afraid of the collapse of the United States once the transition of presidential power occurs and they start rioting and, and they're gonna attack where this person lives apparently in a big hotel on Fifth Avenue, AKA Trump Towers on Fifth <laughs> Avenue. And so it's this weird thing where this guy wrote two books, one about uh, Baron Trump and the other about the last president, which is a president who is involved in some kind of scandal or uh, it's unclear to me because I haven't read the book. It's unclear whether it's this person was corrupt or the person he's protesting is corrupt, but it, it ends up with this sort of riot happening in New York City on Fifth Avenue at this big tower. So you had heard of this before? Yeah, I've heard of heard of it, heard of this before, and then you know that was like four years ago when 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 you know when Trump was president, and some of them uh, even talk about you know John Theater T I T O R. Okay, yeah, that's another one. Yep. Where, but that's related to this guy was posting kind of predict in, in two thousand. This guy John yep. Theodore was posting some predictions for the year twenty twenty or twenty thirty, and. I haven't really delved into that theory. I was more uh, fascinated with this Baron Trump thing because that actually, because the, the John Teeter one, someone admitted, oh, he made that up. Right. But this actually was the, the Adventures of Baron Trump or Baron Trump's Marvelous Underground Journey was actually written in like 1890 by this guy Ingersoll Lockwood. Do you, do you read the book at all? I, I skimmed through it and it's really, really bad. It's like unbelievably bad. Wait, do you, so, so, okay. So do you think... Donald Trump is a traveler or the writer is a traveler? I don't know. It could be the writer. So here's the description. Uh, oh, here's the description of, from the last president, which was written in 1896. Right. The entire east side of New York City is in a state of uproar. Mobs of vast size are organizing under the lead of anarchists and socialists and threaten to plunder and despoil the houses of the rich who have wronged and oppressed them for so many years. It's weird. So during 2017, this book became noticed and people started thinking all these time traveling things, but it really reminds me more of 2020 when yeah. people were on both sides. Like if Trump won, everybody was going to say he manipulated the election and there was going to be in New York city, police were preparing for like riots. Right. And of course Trump lost. And so the reverse happened, which is that, you know, he said there was a whole corrupt election process and there was all these protests and right. there was January 6th. And by the way, the election was on November 3rd in 2020, just like it was in 1896 or in 1900, whatever the, the novel was about. And uh, so there's all these weird coincidences. Now, do I actually believe there's, oh, there's one more thing. It's an interesting thing. So we all know Tesla, the company, but of yep. course, many people have forgotten that Nikola Tesla was a real person. He was a, a, a mm -hmm. competitor to Thomas Edison, the details of which are not, they are important historically, but I won't mention them now, but he was this genius, this electricity genius. And when he died, the FBI, he died in like, I think 1943, yep. when he died, the FBI wanted to make sure that none of his papers were described any weapons. Cause for instance, Tesla was trying to get funding 
he said he made this new weapon called the death ray that could yep. kill anybody with like a wave. So the FBI wanted to do some due diligence. Was this true or not? So they asked a professor at MIT named John G. Trump to investigate. And John Trump took all of Tesla's papers and went through them and said, oh, no, there's nothing here to look at. But do we really? what does this have to do with Donald Trump? Well, John Trump actually is Donald Trump's uncle. And so there's another connection here that maybe Trump, you know, John Trump, you know, worked with Tesla to come up with some weird technology that now Donald Trump is aware of. But I'm just saying, what? I don't believe in any of these things, but there's just like all these weird conspiracy theories floating around. <laughs> so, so you think you think Donald Trump actually has a uh, death rate in his process? Or maybe he's, maybe John Trump actually created the time machine that, that, that Baron Trump went back. Because uh, yeah, that's that's a that's a theory too. Isn't Baron like his middle name or something like that? I could be wrong. Oh, that's his son's name. Yeah, it's his son's name. So so in the Baron Trump series, and by the way, there's a picture of Baron Trump on the cover of this 1890 novel, and it does look a little bit like the Baron Trump if you look at the cover. So I encourage people to to Google Ingersoll Lockwood and the Baron Trump novels, and it's just funny. Like I find this to be funny more than anything. I do think the book, The Last President, that Ingersoll Lockwood wrote is a little bit more like Donald Trump, but it's this weird coincidence that he wrote that book and the Baron Trump series. I will state that he, the Baron Trump, the way he writes it is spelled B-A-R-O-N because yep. he's actually a baron. And right. th this Baron Trump, Donald Trump's son, is B-A-R-R-O-N. Uh -huh. and, and also in the Baron Trump series, someone named Don gives Baron Trump advice on where he should journey to. But... That was not a real name. It was like how it was like a Spanish person. So it's how Don is Mister in Spanish. So, so it's crazy how maybe Baron Trump is actually the the time traveler, and then you know he he he's forced he saw all this happen, and then he went back and write write it, and then you know maybe, it, they. You, maybe there's another theory that you know maybe all this could have happened, but you know let's call them the time traveler police that actually stopped all this from happening. Because it was so close of happening, right? Like, and then somehow, you know, it just didn't happen. Yeah, and what what TV shows have time traveler police? There's like Quantum Leap. Yes, that's um, kind of a time traveler police, right? Is it called The Messenger? Or oh, oh and wait, Netflix. isn't there one with Bruce Willis? Uh, Looper. It's called Looper. Oh uh, no, yeah, there was Looper, and I get that confused with Jumper. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Looper is the one with uh, Bruce Willis and uh, who is the guy name? Uh, oh, who was like the young? Yeah, I can't uh, okay. remember. Yeah. Oh, Joseph Gordon Levitt. Oh yeah, I like him, Joseph Gordon Levitt. Yeah. yeah, he's great. Yeah, yep. um, I think there's a couple others too, but uh, yeah. and obviously Terminator is is a little bit under that. Ah, uh, Terminator. It's a, is it a police though? Terminator. It's well, more like Terminator he... is like the evil robot police that go back to to get the person who who leads the rebellion. Right. Well, oh, right. But them. it's not like it's to not correct. Yeah. yeah, it's not. It's not to correct problems in the space time continuum. Right. Well, maybe, maybe, maybe it's not police. Maybe it's like two rival, right? Just like Terminator, he's going back and trying to create all this new timeline, and these the other person trying to go back and and um, trying to prevent that happen. It's just like killing Hitler, baby. You know, baby yeah. Hitler, killing baby Hitler. I will tell you, and then we'll stop this topic. <laughs> The best Star Trek episode ever of the original uh, series is. Do you, do you know the one? I, um, I do, I'm not a Star Trek fan. I'm all through and through Star Wars. Fans. I am through and through Star Wars as well. But City on the Edge of Forever was a beautiful, beautiful Star Wars episode from Wait, the Star Trek. a Star Trek episode from the original like 1968 series where uh, they do something that destroys the Earth in the future, and so the whole episode is about correcting what. Dr. McCoy accidentally did back right. in Depression era New York. Beautiful episode, such a beautiful episode. Then Einstein has like this uh, time travel uh, theory: is that like anything that change, uh, you know, if someone go back and change uh, a timeline or the past, um, eventually the time will fix itself. But I can't remember what is it called. I, I don't know. I thought uh, we'll have to ask Professor Dr. Brian Keating. Dr. Brian Keating almost winner of the Nobel Prize. We'll have to ask him about this. But I think in Einstein's theory, he basically theorizes that it is possible to travel. Oh, I forgot what Brian said. One direction or the other, but not both. You can't... Right. I forgot which direction, though, you could travel. And the, I think to the future, not to the, to the past, I think. 
Oh yeah, not to the past. I so, think, yeah. in any case, this is just a side note. If you want to have a lot of fun, an afternoon of fun for the family, for everyone, look up Ingersoll Lockwood and the Adventures of Baron Trump, written in 1889, right. and also the book The Last President, written in 1896, that describes very accurately, including a mob, a mob riding at Trump Tower on Fifth Avenue. Uh, go check it out. Was Ingersoll Lockwood talking to a time traveler or not? Yeah, we should. One day we should have some like a uh, like a prophet come on to talk about all the all the time that yeah. someone has prophesied someone. You know who who would be an expert on this is our old friend uh, Jesse Michaels. We should get him back on. Oh, and he, he'll probably he's probably an expert on this. I thought he's only uh, only UFO. expert on UFOs. Yeah. Uh, you don't think if okay, well, let's get Robert F. Kennedy Jr. back on, <laughs> and you know, yes. he's probably an expert. Yeah. So he's probably <laughs> Tom Tom Rosso. <laughs> anyway, and, back to decisions making. Oh my gosh, I love these clothes. Mizzen and Maine, that's M-I-Z-Z-E-N and Maine. It really is the most comfortable work clothes. Travel clothes, I'm tra I am had to travel this whole week. I'm traveling for a week and a half and I just took Mizzen and Maine clothes with me. Close out 2023 in style with comfortable, breathable, packable and machine washable pieces from Mizzen and Maine. As you wrap up your year-end goals, enjoy a Mizzen and Maine dress shirt that you can wear confidently. I like that they've very, very just nice, solid colors. I don't really like to get all fancy in patterns and everything, although they do have some pattern shirts, but very comfortable clothes, stretchable pants. It's just super comfortable, but they look professional and they, you can wear them casually or professionally. I like some of their flannel shirts or untuck shirts. I love untuck. I never tuck in. So again, uh, whether you're shopping for a special someone or giving yourself the gift you really want, I just buy myself gifts. Mizzen and Maine is the perfect gift for any guy who works, travels, and or cares about looking and feeling great. As you could tell by my many photos across the internet, I care about looking fantastic. I'm practically a model. And let's be honest, Every guy loves to look great. So again, shop now at mizzenandmain.com and save 20% when you spend $130 or more using promo code James. That's promo code James at Mizzen and Main, M-I-Z-Z-E-N and Main.com. You know what I love about fantasy sports is that even though I'm not going to be a great basketball player or a baseball player or a football player or whatever, I feel like I get to participate and make decisions and use my knowledge of these different leagues to, or these different sports to, to compete. So it's like I can pick my team or I can pick my favorite players and I could use my knowledge to make predictions and maybe even make money. So with the basketball season here, you can now pick combo projections across football and basketball from the specials league on prize picks. This is a league created specifically for combo projections that include two or more players from different sports or leagues. Want to play alongside some of prize picks, favorite players like rapper Meek Mill and comedian Andrew Schultz, who's also been a guest on this podcast and I've been a guest on his. You can now find community plays under the promos tab of the app to view entries for some of the biggest names in the prize picks community each week. Look, prize picks even offers a reboot policy so that your entries stay in play. Even if one of your players gets injured for football and basketball games, if you have a player who exits the game in the first half and does not return in the second, that player is rebooted. Prize picks is the only daily fantasy sports platform with an injury insurance policy. What? So, I love playing it. I love anywhere where I can use analytical ability with my interests to demonstrate some skill and maybe make some money. And I like the game like aspect. I do wish they had chess as a category on prizepicks.com, but I'll set up for what they've got. Maybe I should make my own fantasy chess league. But in any case, I love prize picks. Go to prizepicks.com slash James. 
Use code James for a first deposit match up to $100. That's the easiest $100 you're ever going to make. So that's prizepicks.com slash James and use code James. Daily Fantasy Sports made easy. All right, decision making. So it's very interesting because, again, I think there's a lot of bad things you could do with decision making. And I think the, the key with decision making is what, what are the goals of decision making? Is A, you want to take actions that make your life better. And B, you don't want to waste too much time doing it. Or you could spend all, all your time trying to decide things. Let me ask you this if, you know, sometimes you have to decide between which is less severe or less worse, will you consider those uh, decision-making as well? Like- Absolutely. I mean, there's all kinds of decision-making. There's long-term decision-making, like, should I take this job or this job? Should I go out with this person or this person? Should I have a baby or not have a baby? Should I buy a house or not buy a house? Like, there's these very long-term decisions that one can make. And then there's everyday decisions that, that you have to make on a daily basis, like, oh, what should I wear today? What should I eat today? Uh, what should I do today? It's a free day. Like, uh, uh, so, so there's very short term decision making. And, and by the way, those, whether, whether you make good decisions or bad decisions on even very, very short term decisions, uh, those, the good and the bad add up and they compound. So you don't want to make consistently bad short term decisions or else like, oh, I'll just eat another cupcake today. Cause eventually you weigh 500 pounds. Right. So, so short-term decisions could have just as much effect as long-term decisions, particularly since you have to make them every day. If you, if you don't have a process for short-term decisions, your life could turn out very bad. And there's also this kind of like creative decisions. Like, oh, you have to be creative about something. How do you be creative? And you would think that, well, creativity isn't about having a system for decision-making. That's the whole point of creativity is to be like thinking out of the box and and like going crazy a little bit and coming up with stuff you never came up with before. But there's actually a model and methodology you could use for creativity as well. And so I look at big decisions that I've made in my life and particularly bad ones. And fortunately, I've learned a lot from them. So sorry, can I can I ask you what's your worst decision to ever make? Well, if you had to choose one. Yeah, I think I mean, it's hard to say what's the worst because I don't have a way of measuring them. Right. Like maybe you measure them by how unhappy you were later, or maybe you measure them by how much you learned later, or maybe you measure them by how much money you made. But what about those that you keep thinking about? You think you keep going back and like, oh, maybe I should have like... Okay. Yeah, I definitely made bad financial decisions several times in my life that made me to go broke, not once, but more than once. And I regret them. Like a lot of people will say, and I understand why they say, I'm like, I have no regrets because I wouldn't be the person I am today. I wouldn't want to change my life now for what my life was then. And I agree with that too. But I do wish I had made smarter decisions about money and and that my life still turned out the way it is now, even if I made you know, good decisions instead of bad decisions about money. So I do have some regrets. Maybe it wouldn't be possible to live the life I have now if I had mm-hmm only made good decisions about money earlier. And, you know, but also you, you know, I've made certain decisions about, you know, partners, spouses, friends, uh, all sorts of things that I regret later. And, and again, but again, though, full circle, there's obviously it's hard to have regrets. And this is actually, this is actually a very important concept for short-term decision-making. Like if you're thinking too much about something you regret regret from the past and so, or something you're worried about in the future, even a decision about what to think about is a bad decision. So like if I'm thinking, if I'm choosing to think about something I regret and I'm just wallowing in it or something I'm worried about it and I'm just like up at night thinking about it, I could be doing something better with my thoughts and better with my time. So one, one good methodology I use when I'm deciding even when I notice myself thinking about a regret too much or a worry too much is, am I living in the here and now? Because a regret, you're sort of time traveling to the past and you're putting yourself in the past and imagining what if you had made a different decision. And a worry, you're sort of time traveling to the future, which you can't possibly predict unless you're Baron Trump. And <laughs> and you're, you're, you're thinking too much about decisions that haven't happened yet that put you in some futuristic situation that you're worried about. 
And so, yeah, it's good to avoid some of the worries and it's a good to learn from your regrets and things that you did poorly in the past, but you don't want to spend too much time, time traveling to the past or time traveling to the future. Again, unless you're a time traveler policeman like Baron Trump. Trump. <laughs> so so that, that's one good model of how to think. Another model for short term that's very important to me, and I wrote about this in the book, Choose Yourself, but when I had been on my worst moments when broke, I really, as many listeners know, I really decided, okay, I can't change what happened, but I need to move forward. And I can't worry too much about the future. Like at the time, I was really in a state of nonstop panic and regret, regret over the financial decisions that made me broke. And this was not just in 2000, but also in 2008, 2009, other, other times in my life, 2004. Anyway, there was many times. And uh, I really decided, okay, I just today, the only thing I have control over is not what I already did and not what's going to happen in the future, but can I make decisions that today improve myself physically, you know, whether it's improving my diet, improving my sleep, improving my exercise, can I make decisions that improve myself emotionally? So improves the relationships I have. And that means like, am I really cultivating this concept of you're the average of the five people you spend your time with? And are you doing stuff to nurture those five relationships and, and, and on and on? Am I doing, making decisions in the short term that help myself mentally or creatively? And so that came to this, you know, I would write down 10 ideas a day and, and so on. And am I doing, making decisions that improve me spiritually? And that doesn't mean going to some church or synagogue or whatever, but am I getting con used to the concept of surrendering to things that are outside my control? And so to some extent, that's a notion of faith, not in, let's say, the, you know, a, a, a mythical being, although it could be that, but also faith in myself. Like if I do my best, do I have faith that the best things will turn out, will, will, everything will turn out okay? Or if they don't, I did the best I could do anyway. And that's all I, uh, you know, that's kind of a spiritual way of looking, uh, a secular spiritual way of looking at daily situations. Now, I remember one time, by the way, it's not so bad to have faith in a religion because it also helps you avoid worry. I remember one time, this was in 2000, early 2004, I was running my fund of hedge funds, or maybe it was 2005, or I forget what year now, but I was running my fund of hedge funds and something happened that was going to make this spiral out of control and I would go out of business. And so I remember I bought all these books about the philosophy of Star Wars. The, you know, I watched all the movies over. I bought these books about the force, basically, I, you know, analyzing the philosophy of the force. And I totally devoted myself to surrendering to the force. And I actually think it is connected that my business did work out because having faith in something and surrendering to, to something that was larger than myself, I don't think the force necessarily came in and saved my business, but I think it allowed me to not worry or regret so much. And it gave me faith that I was going to try my best and, and make the best decisions because it was going to be, you know, natural. And I was, I was trusting basically my personal efforts rather than trying to control the universe around me. I was trusting that the universe would respond accordingly if I did my best. Do you think it could be some sort of bias? It's like, hey, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna let go of everything and just move forward. Like I just trust this decision. Yeah, because you might be biased. For instance, there's all sorts of biases that affect your decision making. Right. Like for instance, if I think I'm gonna fail, then I'm only gonna notice stories of people that failed. Right. <laughs> and I would kind of attach myself too much to those stories. And I would start making decisions that reminded me of those stories, almost like self-sabotaging myself. So I would end up like those stories as well. That could happen in relationships as well. Like you want your relationship to succeed, but you start noticing all the relationships that are failing and you start thinking, oh, that's just like me. And you start making decisions that mirror, you know, you basically mirror what you're looking at. Like you're, you, like your brain has these mirror neurons. So if I look at, let's say I've never climbed a ladder before, but I looked at, but I watched someone climbing a ladder, my neur, my mirror neurons will, will trigger. And I'll, will will kind of learn by just looking at, I'll learn how to climb a ladder myself. And so if all I'm looking at and all I'm noticing are, you know, this cognitive bias is called the Toyota effect. Like once you buy a Toyota, you notice all the other Toyotas 
on the road. You never noticed, you never, you never, you never said to yourself, boy, I can't believe how many Toyotas there are. But after you buy a Toyota or a Tesla, like Jay, I bet you notice all the Teslas oh, on the road yes. right now since you bought a Tesla. I'm, not, so I'm not special if, anymore. Right. So if you think you're in a bad job or bad relationship or you're going broke, you'll start to notice all the other stories that you see in your life or in the news or whatever that are like what you imagine yourself to be. And you'll start, you only have those as examples. So you start to make, it's almost like you won't be able to stop yourself like a magnet from making decisions related to these stories you're viewing. And uh, uh, so, so that's why it's very important to have this sense of surrender. Mm. And, and again, you have to be in good physical health, good emotional health, good creative health, good spiritual health to be able to do this. But you detach yourself from these bad stories. You just surrender. So you don't assume that any story that you're going to, or you could start looking at stories of success. Like you could surrender and you could say, I'm going to do my best. And that's going to be enough to, to make me successful. And I'll trust that because I'm, everything else is rolling smoothly, like my physical health, creative health, whatever, I'll trust that good things will happen. And so you start attaching yourself and noticing good stories. Wait, and so, I'm going to talk a little bit more about the decision-making of creativity in a bit, but go ahead. Jay. Yeah. So what about the phrase like F it? Is that considered a surrendering yourself? A, a little bit. It depends. It depends a little bit. Like, let's say you're like, um, oh, I can't pay my mortgage this month. So I'm going to take all of my savings and I'm going to put it on, I'm going to go to Las Vegas and I'm going to put it on black at the roulette table, you know, screw it. Like, um, um, screw it, just do it. As Richard Branson would say, yeah. like you have to be able to model risks right. also. And, and you have to be able to understand the consequences of risks. Like, would you rather not make your mortgage and still have $3,000 in the bank? Or would you take the risk that you're going to have $0 in the bank and not make your mortgage? Like, so what are the consequences of that? And are there other choices you could have? Like, could you just stop paying your mortgage, for instance, what would happen? Well, maybe it would take 90 days to evict you. And during that time, you could have time to either find another place to live, or you could have time to make enough money to, to make a new deal with the bank so they don't evict you, or you could have time to you know raise or borrow or make the money to pay your mortgage. So you have to understand all the risks of every decision you do. Like, let's say, again, I was going to put all my money in one in investment. Okay. I know that that investment decision might be good. Let, let, let's say I have a good investment decision-making process, which I'll talk about my personal decision-making process in a little bit. But let's say I have a good investment decision-making process. A stock still could go up or down in the short term. Right. We don't know. So we know this. We also know the stock market could crash and then the stock I invested in could go down. We know this. I also know that there are things I don't know. I don't know if there's fraud, for instance, in the business. So there are things I don't know. And there also just because some weird thing. Like, I don't know if a nine 11 is going to happen. Like I, I was, I was a hundred, like the day before nine 11 is a good example. I was a day trader. Then the market had just fallen something like four or five days in a row. And I had basically one of the first AI based trading systems software that I wrote to trade the markets. And it signaled, this is a huge, enormous buy. So I was like 150% invested in the market on the morning of 9-11. Of course, nobody would have guessed a terrorist attack was going to occur three blocks away from my house at the time. And so that was, as Donald, as Donald Rumsfeld once put it, that was an unknown unknown. Like I didn't, I had no clue that was going to happen. And my system, of course, didn't know that was going to happen. And so that's a risk I should have, you know, contemplated, which I didn't back then. Right. And, and this was when I was first learning trading and, and it was a very excruciating process to say the, the least. But I just want to emphasize again, these short-term decisions, like very, very important on a daily basis. Like I even ask myself at the end of each day and I tell my kids to do this, you know, did you make decisions that improved yourself 1% physically, emotionally, creatively, spiritually, and that will compound. And, you know, other you know, short-term models for decision-making, there's something called choice overload. So let's say, like, and Steve Jobs is very famous for this. Like he wore, I think he wore jeans and like a black turtleneck every day, so, something like that. So he didn't want to have to decide. I mean, he's a very smart guy. He could have decided every day, oh, I'm going to wear a different outfit. He's certainly smart enough to figure out what outfit to wear and to vary it up a little bit. But he decided, I'm not going to use a single 
spare thought on things I don't have to. Every thought, you could think of every thought as requiring some energy. And you start off the day with a lot of energy. And by the end of the day, you don't have any energy left. You've, you've done your 60,000 thoughts. They, people estimate that you think 60,000 thoughts a day. I don't know if that's how they come up with that number, but he didn't want to waste any of those thoughts. Mark Zuckerberg does something similar about his clothes. Or you could just decide, you don't have to be so obsessive about it. You could just decide that if I have two choices that are roughly similar, it doesn't really matter what choice. So if I'm in the store, I'm trying to decide whether to buy Kellogg's cornflakes or Quaker Oats cornflakes. Well, they're basically the same. So don't try to make a decision. Just pick one or make a rule. I'm always going to pick Kellogg's cornflakes. What reason? No reason, because it just doesn't matter. So Steve Jobs made a rule. I'm always going to wear this. So it, it, it simplified how he bought outfits, what outfits to wear, what outfits to clean, you know, and so on. Like it simplified that whole process in his life. Or if someone eats the same meal, again, simplifies the whole process. I'm not saying you should do this, but I'm saying what things in your life do you put too much time thinking about? And right. for someone like Steve Jobs, the clothes he wore, we don't know what other short-term decisions he simplified, but try to simplify. If, you, if you're driving to work, oh, do you decide between taking the highway or taking these other roads, even though they both take the same amount of time most of the time, or you're trying to decide what lane to get into on the highway? It doesn't really matter. Don't decide. Just pick a lane and stick with it. And you might not be always happiest with Kellogg's Corn Flakes as opposed to Captain Crunch cereal, but in the long run, you, you would have saved so much time and energy making having a process for making a simple decision that you'll benefit in other ways. So you, don't, you won't always make the optimal decision, but you'll make, on average, pretty good decisions using a very simple rule-based technique to avoid what's called choice overload. Yeah, that's what I did uh, for my meals. Like every day, my breakfast is the same. And, uh, same with breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And if I go out, I, I tell myself, if I go out just by myself, I only go to Chick-fil-A. Yeah, uh, that that's a good, or, or like if you, for me, if it's not easy for me to, you know, cook a meal, which is never easy for me, <laughs> unless there's a meal already lying around uh, the house, I'll use Uber Eats and I always order from the same place on Uber Eats. Yeah. Or if I'm trying to decide on an Uber, you know, you already have a rule in place, whether you're going to do Uber, you know, are you going to choose Uber XL all the time? Or are you going to choose the cheapest one all the time? Are you going to choose the fastest one? These are simple rules that you don't have to think or decide because that adds up. Imagine if everything of your 60,000 thoughts, let's say 20,000 of those thoughts took an extra three seconds to decide. Well, that's 60,000 extra seconds you used. I, I'm making these numbers up because that seems too high. But right. uh, even if every thought cost you an extra half a second, all right, it's just too much time. So, so as much as possible, if you could simplify, or, or for instance, you can use the the, the choose yourself model of the physical, emotional, creative, spiritual. Like if you're deciding what to do next during the day, does it fall under one of those four categories? If not, then forget it. Like if you're about to decide making to watch TikTok for an hour, that might not conform to the choose yourself model, even though it might be fun. So you wouldn't do it. But now, like I say, let's say I'm going to watch a YouTube video and I say, okay, I'm going to watch a YouTube video, but it's going to be educational or it's going to help me in some way, then that might fit into the mental. Or if it's going to make me feel better, it might fit into the emotional or spiritual. I, I don't know. So you could use some model of how you want to live your life. Like, let's say I'm going to make a phone call to a friend. Well, is this one of the five people I want to surround myself with? You know, you're, again, you're the average of the five people you surround yourself with, or you're the average of the 25 people, your five people surround themselves with. Right. And so you could call one of those people and improve your relationship with that person. Or you could call someone you want to have an argument with and you could call them and have an argument that might not improve you emotionally. And it might be a source of misery for you in life. You know, so, so these are all, again, we're going to talk about long-term and we're going to, I think there's three types of decision-making. There's short-term slash short-term energetic ones, like where you, know, you have this physical, emotional, mental, spiritual framework of making most decisions during your day. And for other things, you can use a bunch of simple rules like, okay, I'm not going to wallow in regrets. I'm not going to wallow in worries. Am I living in the here and now? Am I avoiding choice overload? One thing 
I, I want to say it also, if, if I'm saying, you know, a lot of times people call me and say, Hey, do you want to do X, Y, or Z? Do you want to speak at this conference? Do you want to go on this podcast? Do you want to blah, blah, blah. I like the Derek Sivers model. If it's not a hell yeah, then say no. And so sometimes even after I say yes, if I realize later, oh, that wasn't a hell yeah, I'll say no. Okay. And it's very important. If I find myself wondering later, like, why did I agree to that? Just because I said yes earlier, I'm not going to necessarily just do it. Just because I said yes earlier, I'll still say no. And, you know, you have to nurture yourself and take care of yourself. And you do that long enough and you discipline yourself long enough to, to be aware of when it's not a hell yeah. Eventually you stop saying yes. I say right. yes now to maybe, I mean, I say no now to maybe 99% of the things I used to say yes to. So when I say yes to something now, I pretty much, it's a hell yeah. But that takes practice. Like you can't just do that overnight. That's like a muscle that you have to practice. So I would say that's the entirety of my short-term decision making. Oh, one more thing, which is when I'm having conversation with someone, let's say I'm at a meeting or a party or whatever, before I say something, I usually try to think, is this more of a question or more of a me stating my opinion? And I would rather make decisions about saying questions than opinions. So again, that's a very short-term type of decision-making technique. What do you mean by questions or, or, or? Let's say I'm at a party and everyone's arguing about, I don't know, gun control. And I, and I don't want to enter the conversation. And I feel like I want to say, well, you know, oh, we need guns to protect ourselves. Or if, I'm, if I feel like I'm saying, oh, uh, you know, guns kill people. So the fewer guns, let fewer people kill. Rather than stating an opinion, I'd rather say, hey, what's a country that eliminated guns? And then what were the statistics afterwards? So better to ask a question than to give an opinion. You know what? Because no one really gives a shit about my opinions anyway. Sorry right. for the language. But I want to better for me to learn more anyway. This is such a valuable service for all business owners, big businesses, small businesses, doesn't matter. I wish I had this in the many different businesses that I've started. Sometimes it seems like your business is humming, but then suddenly you don't understand it. You're starting to fall behind. You're not understanding what, where your costs are, where your revenues are, where, where your payments are. Teams are buried in all sorts of like BS work and you can't seem to close the books. So you need like one dashboard, one source of truth. I'm jealous of this business, NetSuite from Oracle, of course, NetSuite by Oracle. I wish I'd come up with this idea. It's, it's, it's a brilliant concept to have all your business intelligence on one dashboard. This is why you need to know these three numbers, 37,000, 25, and one. So 37,000, that's the number of businesses which have upgraded to NetSuite by Oracle. NetSuite is the number one cloud financial system, streamlining accounting, financial management, inventory, HR, and more. 25, NetSuite turns 25 this year. That's 25 years of helping businesses do more with less, close their books in days, not weeks, and drive down costs. One, because your business is one of a kind. So you get a customized solution for all of your key performance indicators, your KPIs, in one efficient system with one source of truth manage risk, get reliable forecasts, and improve margins. Everything you need to grow all in one place. So right now, download NetSuite's popular KPI checklist designed to give you consistently excellent performance absolutely free at netsuite.com slash James. That's netsuite.com slash James to get your own KPI checklist. netsuite.com slash James. The future of learning is definitely online. Like it's such BS that you have to spend $200,000 or take $200,000 in loans and go to some fancy school when it's useless. It doesn't guarantee you a job. Most employers, including me, do not care about degrees or grades or anything like that. We want to care that you love what you're doing, that you know what you're doing, in some cases that you have experience or that you're willing to learn. But People in general love learning and are curious. Like the key to success is curiosity. And I think masterclass.com is the perfect model 
for online learning. I'm really happy they're, they're sponsoring uh, this episode. If you're going to give a gift, give the gift of learning. Masterclass makes a meaningful gift this season for you and anyone on your list because both of you can learn from the best to become your best from leadership to effective communication to cooking. Let me tell you some of the classes I've taken. I've taken comedy from Steve Martin. I mean, can you believe I can take a class from Steve Martin on comedy or Judd Apatow, my favorite comedy director. I could take an actual class from him on writing. Wolfgang Puck on cooking. Dan Brown on writing. Or Judy Bloom, who's been on this podcast, on writing. By the way, Wolfgang Puck also has been on this podcast. It's such a pleasure. I, I try to take classes all the time from masterclass.com. And whether you're watching Masterclass on TV or listening in audio mode in the app or on their site, the quality speaks for itself. It's like these Masterclass instructors are your own personal mentors that are going to help you reach the next level. How much would it cost to take one-on-one -on -one classes on comedy from Steve Martin or on chess from Gary Kasparov? You just wouldn't be able to do it. But it would, I mean, it would cost hundreds of thousands of dollars. With a Masterclass annual membership, it's $10 a month. Membership started at $120 a year for unlimited access to one-on-one -on -one classes with all 180 plus masterclass instructors. So it's not just $120 for one instructor. You get all 180 plus masterclass instructors. Boost your confidence and find practical takeaways you can apply to your life and at work. And if you own a business or are a team leader, use Masterclass to empower and create future-ready employees and leaders. That's the real education in today's world. So this holiday season, you can give one annual membership and get one free at masterclass.com slash JAS. JAS, of course, stands for the James Altucher Show. So right now you can get two memberships for the price of one at masterclass.com slash JAS. Masterclass.com slash JAS. Offer terms apply. And then there's long-term. Like what sort of long-term decisions do we have to make? Do you make, Jay? Financial, long-term financial. And then like buying cars or not buying cars, where to live or, or going back to Malaysia or stay here or, you know. What, are you thinking of going back to Malaysia? No, no. <laughs> like, or, or, or like, um, uh, you know, should I start a studio or should I not build a studio or should I not, uh, where do I want to live and stuff like that. Those are the long-term uh decisions but let okay. me ask you this though yeah it's, it's voting for presidential elections or any elections consider long term or short term uh that's a good question i would say it's not short term because it's not it's not short term in the sense this is what i have to deal with every day i don't have to vote for president right. every day so it's sort of long term like and you could argue it's long term because it's like oh what kind of political system do i want to live in for the next 4 years and voting is an interesting one because I, on purpose, have never voted in a presidential election in my entire life. And there's a lot of reasons. And before the 2020 uh, uh, election, I had written why I wasn't going to vote. And somebody invited me to participate in a debate. I wrote about this. Maybe we could put the URL uh, in the show links because I wrote about, how this, about this debate and how the person I was debating or the people I were debating did not they didn't really debate properly, meaning they just instead decided to use anecdotes or insult me personally or whatever. And, you know, again, I, I'd rather get facts than opinions and I'd rather uh, understand what all the facts are. But just to say, like, I have a rule, which is that if something prevents me from being neutral politically for the purposes of this podcast, then I won't do it. So before going into the 2020 election, I had liberals, conservatives, uh, libertarians, people of all political stripes on this podcast. Like Tim Ryan was running for president in the Democrat primaries, very liberal. Uh, but, you know, on the flip side, we've had on conservative campaign managers. We had on Barack Obama's speechwriter. We had on RFK Jr., although we didn't release that till recently. Um, we had on Andrew Yang. I've had on Ron Paul, like all angles of the political spectrum, because it helps me, which I hope helps the listeners make a more informed decision. And so I feel like if I vote, that'll cognitively bias me towards one side or the other. It's like if you make a bet, it's hard to be neutral after you've placed a bet. But uh, but Maddie, 
uh, argue otherwise, right? Who who argued otherwise? Uh, Mehdi Has, uh, what's what's his name? Oh right, yeah, Mehdi Hassan. Isn't he? He has the MSNBC show. He's been on the yep. podcast. Yeah, and he's going to come on again. I'm really looking forward to it. And uh, yeah, he said it's impossible for someone to be neutral. And you know, he he wrote a great book, uh, "Win Every Argument: The Art of Debating, Persuading, and Public Speaking." Great book, highly recommend it. Listen to my podcast with him, Mehdi Hassan. Um, really nice guy. And yeah, he argues that. I can't possibly neutral be neutral. I don't know if that's true because I do think creativity plays more of a role in our lives than who the president of the United States is. Like, you know, and this is something I'll, I'll ask Mehdi because I want to know, like, what has changed politically? You know, for instance, all the immigration rules, from what I understand, have stayed the same between Biden and Trump. I don't know. I don't want to get into a political thing because I'm not <laughs> just not that interested in it right now. But if, if many came back on, maybe we could discuss this. And I have a bunch of questions for him to understand, to try and understand what has changed that's affected our lives. Uh, you know, now you could argue Roe versus Wade has made things change a lot, but that was already, you know, the court was already in place before Biden. But that's something that does affect people's lives is who's on the Supreme Court. You know, so we, there was the recent rulings on affirmative action, on reversing Roe versus Wade, and that's definitely probably going to affect people's lives. But it's something that, you know, I'm happy to talk about in another podcast. Right. But so, yeah, so maybe voting is an important decision, but I think I can make better decisions with my political time for me personally by using the podcast as a platform for all sorts of opinions and, and views that I, so I could ask questions and help myself and other people learn. Most people vote without knowing anything. So better to vote with some knowledge. And I think this podcast is a platform for, for knowledge and better for me to be unbiased for me personally. So I'm not saying everyone shouldn't vote. I'm just saying for me personally. Um, but like I would say for long-term decisions, there's jobs, there's relationships, there's education, there's things like, should you start a business? And if so, what kind of business should you start? There's, should you have a baby or not? There's you know, all sorts of things like that. And I do want to say, you know, people have all sorts of models, like, oh, write down the pros, write down the cons, which list is bigger. But I would say there are situations where you can't really make a good or bad decision. For instance, whether or not you should have a baby, it's hard to know in advance whether you're making a good or bad decision. Right. Maybe you say to yourself, if it's not a hell yeah, then no, that would probably be a good framework for having a baby. But other than that, I don't think, you know, you could say, well, if I'm too, if I don't have enough money, I can't have a baby. Or if I don't live in a certain area, or if I'm not a certain age, or don't haven't achieved a certain area and goal in my life, I can't have a baby. I think all of those are BS. Like you can't use any of those to, to it, in other words, in some cases, okay to just make any decision and not worry about it too much. If you actually want to have a baby, don't have a baby. If you don't want to have a baby, that's the one thing. Yeah, because like a lot of people, once they have a baby, it's all their view about baby have changed. Yeah, and and right, and you know, but something like education. Let's look at education for a second. So there's there's education in the traditional route, like sh what college should I go to, and should I even go to college or not? Or there's an education about how can I best. I want to learn something. How can I best learn? So that's two different types of education. One's about actually learning. The other is kind of a lifestyle choice. And I would say with decisions like that, and I talked to Annie Duke about this in our podcast like several years ago, you sort of look at what's important to you. Like it could be how much money you're going to make, how much you're going to learn and quality of life. And you say, well, you kind of just add it up. Well, what's the expected value? If I decide to go to Harvard as opposed to community college, as opposed to no college, what's the odds that I'm going to make more money? What's the odds that I'm going to have higher quality of life? What's the odds that you know, I'm going to be a happier person. And we don't really know the answer. So you just have to figure it out, but you could, but I would research it like, oh, it turns out people from Harvard make on average 70,000 a year. And people who go to community college make on average 60,000 a year, but have zero debt. Whereas someone from Harvard might have $400,000 in debt. And so you could do research on the things that are important to you and make decisions that way. And then people could have arguments with you. Oh no, you're wrong about this. Or you're wrong about that. But if you do enough research, it's not going to help you make a decision, but 
you'll, at least you'll be equipped with more facts to, to maybe make a decision. But again, it's one of those areas like having a baby where, you know, it, it's going to end up how it's going to end up and better to learn how to be happy than to regret any past decision. You know, whether you went to Harvard or vocational school or don't even have a high school degree. And I know many smart people, people who have been on this podcast who don't even have a high school degree and have become very successful. And of course, yeah. we've had many Harvard grads or whatever who have come on the podcast as well. So, um, but I would say like, if you're trying to learn something new, I wrote about a framework where I, if I wanted to learn how to play the guitar, for instance, I asked myself, okay, what are the micro skills I need to learn? Well, I need to learn about music and music theory. Maybe I need to know how to read music. I need to learn how to actually make a sound from a guitar. And mm -hmm. so these are micro skills I would need to learn. Maybe I could look up some of that on YouTube or whatever. And then very important for me is who's my plus, who's my minus, who's my equals. So plus is who's going to be your teacher or coach minus who are you going to teach? Because if you can't explain something simply, then you don't truly understand it. And who are going to be my equals? Like who's learning how to play the guitar at the same time as me that we could trade notes and study together and learn together and so on. And then with the coach, you sort of study what you need to know. The coach, you, you, you do something like you play a song and the coach tells you what you did, you were wrong. And then you go back to the drawing board. You, you study, you practice, you, you do, and then you get some feedback and then repeat. And this is, you know, this is the way I learned. So micro skills and then plus minus equals, and then study, do feedback, repeat. And it's very important to do these things. You know, I will say for some things though, you want to have a process like investing. If I am going to invest in something and it might be a stock or it might be a private investment, or it might be a house, or it might be a car or whatever. Here's my rule-based model that I built up over many, many years of making bad decisions, particularly with investments. I basically asked myself, is someone smarter than me in this investment at the same, basically in the same way that I'm in it? So did Warren Buffett buy this stock at roughly the same price I want to buy this stock? And then I don't need to, then I don't need to wonder anymore. Like, oh, Warren Buffett put 1% of his portfolio in, let's say, you know, IBM stock. So I'll put 1% of my portfolio in IBM stock, knowing of course that Warren Buffett's in a different financial situation than me. So I take that into account, but I always say to myself, I'm never going to argue with Warren Buffett. Like Warren, why did you buy IBM? Are you an idiot or something? Like he's smarter than me as an investor. So I like people smarter than me to do something. So for, another thing is if I am buying a house, I'll look at, well, okay, what town should I pick? Well, I can't really, I don't really know enough to, to predict that, you know, suburban Denver is the right place to buy a home because the real estate market's going to explode there in the next 10 years or the middle of Kansas city or Cincinnati or Atlanta or Miami or whatever. But I'll look, okay, where are smart investors buying houses? And, you know, I'll try to figure out what does it mean to be a smart investor in a house? And then I'll look like, oh, is BlackRock buying a bunch of houses in suburban Atlanta? Oh yeah, they are. So that might be an interesting place to, to buy a house. That would be the beginnings of my research. This works better with stocks or private investments, but it could be used for other things as well. Is that how you buy a, your current house? Yeah. So with my current place, by the way, I've always been against owning a home. I still might not have changed my opinion on that, but I do own a home. And what I did was I looked at all the change of address data coming out of New York City. So New York City, there is a net outflow of people the past three or four years. And I looked at what cities they were moving to. And, and I also talked to, we even had on the podcast, a guy from a home, uh, a home moving business, a house moving business. And where was everybody moving to? And that gave me an idea to, of what cities to look at. And then I found, you know, I looked at houses that seemed to be undervalued given the size of the house or where, or the location or the size of the property. And I had to ask, why is it undervalued? And, and then I made a decision based on that. So I looked at several cities. I narrowed in on Atlanta and outside of Atlanta. 
and found a place I thought was sufficiently undervalued. And so why is something undervalued? Like, isn't that a bad sign? Well, no, maybe somebody needs to move because they just got a divorce or maybe they owe money to the IRS or they're paying a debt or maybe, uh, you know, they had a business that just went out of business or, or, or maybe they, they have a, a, a parent that's sick and so they need to move to where the parent is. So there's reasons why some place might be undervalued and, and the person might be eager to sell other than that the house might be bad. So I think there's something called the five D's, disease, debt, divorce, death, uh, maybe something else. <laughs> so, death. Well, but these are all models, that. like for big decisions like this, right. people have done a lot of work into coming up with models that are easy to remember, like the five D's. Or like if I'm writing, we've had a podcast about like copywriting, that there's the, the five or six U's, urgency, uniqueness, ultra specific, user-friendly, blah, 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 that are models for doing, writing good copy. Or, you know, what's a model for writing a good novel? Oh, the arc of the hero. And we've talked about that in podcasts before. So lots of types of decisions there's really good models for already. Investing, there are many models, whether you're a value investor or a growth investor or an arbitrage investor. But I use a very, very simple one. Is someone smarter than me making this investment? And then I know at least that whatever amount of work I could do to determine this is good or bad. Someone's done more work than me and smarter work than me. And so that's a good way, at least a starting point for me, it's often an end point for what kind of stocks or private businesses I should invest in. Another thing like relationships, I think that's like the baby decision. Like, oh, should I stay with this person or break up with this person? And I think there's no easy, there's no decision model that really works other than looking at extremes. So I think of two things. I think of, is there some line that this person has crossed over? Like, and what is that line? So I decide in advance what those lines are. Like, has someone physically beaten me up? Which has happened in the past. What? And I ended up, they ended that relationship. Or is, is someone verbally abusive to me? Or is someone being very secretive or lying to me? Wait, like, so, someone beat you up? Well, let's just say someone physically abused me. <laughs> and I, I had ultimately, and I stuck, you stick with those relationships because you don't know how to decide. Like now with experience, I know that this is like a really bad thing and nothing would tolerate staying with that person. But it's hard when you're in the, the moment to end it. So you have a line and that's a good reason to break up. And then the other extreme, I always imagine I'm writing the acknowledgements of a book. And if I'm not willing to put someone, if someone's my spouse and I'm not willing to, or, or, or partner in some way, and I'm not willing, willing to put them in the acknowledgements of my book, then that's usually a bad sign. Hmm. And if I put them in the acknowledgements of the book, what would I say? So I've, I study people's acknowledgements. Like everybody who's ever been on this podcast, I've read all of the acknowledgements they've written in their books. So I'm, I know how people thank their spouses and thank their partners and thank their friends. And, and I think, hmm, would I say this about my friends and my partners and so on? And that helps me make decisions is like, I picture, what would I say about this person? I might not even have an acknowledgement, but I picture if I did have an acknowledgement, what would I say about this person in my acknowledgements? And if it's generally a lot of positive stuff, then, oh, okay, this is a good person to have in my life. Two very important models I want to talk about are kind of life goals. What are good goals versus bad goals? If you could say such a thing. And also uh, jobs. So let's talk about jobs first. And this is very much related to the choose yourself mentality that I've tried to develop for myself, sometimes successfully, sometimes not. Let's say you're trying to decide whether you should stay at a job or not. Here's an important th a model that I use, which is have to versus want to. So here's what you should do. Every day for the next two weeks, three weeks, maybe four weeks, at the end of the day, write down what percentage of activities that I do at the job that I had to do versus wanted to do. And if it's both, obviously, then you want, wanted to do takes precedence. So if you wanted to do it and you had to do it, that's a good thing. Hmm. So you put it under that under the wanted to do. And so let's say 60% of the things on Monday you had to do and 40% you actually wanted to do. And write that down every day for three or four weeks. At the end, ask yourself, am I am I okay with this breakdown? Like if 90% of the things I had to do, only 10% of the things I wanted to do, that doesn't sound very good. Well, then you ask, did it change 
over the three weeks? Like, let's say the first day was 90% versus 10% had to, want to. And by the end, it was 80, 20, 80% had to, 20% wanted to. Well, that's a good trend. So maybe you stay at the job because it's trending over time towards things you want to do, you know, that, that you, you're doing as part of the job. And that's an important thing to look at. So I, very early on, I was working at HBO and I got another job offer and I kind of, without thinking about it, did this process. Like the other job offer was almost double what I was making at HBO. So financially, everybody, like my parents, my friends, everybody was encouraging me to take the new job. But at HBO, I really wanted to do a TV show. And was I more likely to do a TV show or something creative at HBO or at the new job? And my ultimate answer was at HBO, I'd be more likely to do what I wanted to do. So I chose to stay at HBO. And and then that helped me negotiate a better salary and so on, because I really wanted to stay there, but I still had room to negotiate. So that's a good model for whether you should pursue a job, stay at a job, continue at a job. You know, let's say your, your trend, the trend is bad. You're moving towards more things you had to do versus wanted to do. You might not leave the job, but you could negotiate, hey, I'd like to do this, this, and this. And Jay's going to call me later and say, James, I really don't want to do audio engineering anymore, blah, blah, blah. But but in general, you can figure out, it helps you figure out what you want to negotiate. It's not just about money. And by the way, here's a good negotiating model. This was taught to me by Dr. Larry Brilliant, his real name, oh. who uh, eradicated, we should get him on the podcast, but I don't know. I haven't spoken to him. He, he was head of Google charities for a while. He, he helped eradicate smallpox in India in, in the seventies. Oh, wow. But anyway, he, he told me always have a bigger list than the person you're negotiating with. So it shouldn't be just about money. It should be about quality of life. It should be about had to versus want to. It should be about, you know, you could have healthcare benefits, vacation bet time. Just make sure you have more things than the other person on your list of things to negotiate so you could give up the nickels for the dimes. Mm -hmm. And I've always thought that was a very good negotiating model. So that's, you know, again, for everything, whether it's jobs, relationship, education, starting a business. Okay, let's talk about starting a business for a second. Is an idea a good, a good idea or a bad idea? Should I start this business or not? So given the fact that you might have a full-time job and so it's hard to start a business because of your lifestyle, that's a different sort of thing. But I like the Jim McKelvey model of starting a business, which is, so I wrote about this in Skip the Line, three different models that you could use to start a business. The Jim McKelvey model, which he wrote about, he's the founder of Square and he wrote about in his book, The Innovation stack. There's the access economy model and there's the humans versus data model, but I, I won't talk about that as much. Uh, Matt Ridley wrote about that in the evolution of everything. Matt Ridley is a great friend of the podcast and has been on several times. So the Jim McKelvey model for starting a business is, am, can I do something? Is there an industry that doesn't service the needs of the bottom one third of society? So he determined, oh, mom and pop stores, like he ran a mom and pop business, they can't accept credit cards. They couldn't accept credit cards. So he started Square to service all the small businesses that weren't big enough to accept credit cards. And he made it possible for them to accept credit cards. So boom, great business, made billions of dollars. The access economy is the model of, there's three categories. There's people who, who have a lot of something. There's people who want a lot of what other people have. And there's the intermediary, the software platform in the middle. So Uber is an example of this. Oh, there's a lot of people who have empty car seats during the day. There's other people who want to use empty car seats to get from one place to another. And Uber is the software in the middle that helps eat, that helps the two sides find each other, pay each other securely, deal with customer service, deal with, you know, uh, reviews and, and all sorts of things. So that, you know, Airbnb is in that model. Even newsletters are in that model. Oh, somebody might have a lot of knowledge about stocks. Another person might want some knowledge about stocks. And the newsletter is kind of the access, helps people access, one side access the other people. So that's the access economy. And then the humans to data. Oh, if something's done by humans, is there a way to automate this? And we're seeing this a lot with AI right now. Like AI has unleashed this model uh, a, a new generation of this model, just like the internet did before that. 
So just like crypto sometimes does and so on. So I guess what I'm trying to say with all of these long-term models is there's no one set of rules, but with each thing you do, there's a model for doing it better. And I hope I described, I described how I, the model I use for different things. And some of that might make sense to people. Others might say, oh, I have, there's other things, but that's my long-term sets of decision-making models. And then the final thing I want to talk about is creativity models. But Jay, did you have a question or anything? I'm going to, I'm going to use all those models. Because like starting starting business is hard, right? Like, like, like I always want to start a a studio, but but you're right. Like, if I start a studio, is my studio is gonna serve another one third of of the populations, or, or what's the purpose of my studio? Is it just my need, or is yeah, it just it could, I want it could a studio? Be, it could be that you, you want to do a higher percentage of of what you of what you want to do versus have to do, so you're fine starting a me too business like oh there's not other studios all over the place but there's such high demand that i know i'll at least make a living and i get to do what i want to do all day long right. so you know whether or not you should start a business it, you know it depends what your your goals are and oh i did want to talk about goals so it's great to have goals and there's a saying you know it's the journey not the destination that you should value which i don't know if that's true or not but I do want to say that if you have a goal, make sure your goal is consistent with your happiness. So right. here's, a, here's a mathematical formula to think about happiness. Happiness is expectations divided by reality. So let's say um, you, you have a weight loss goal. Let's say you're 500 pounds. I'm just making this up. Let's say you're 500 pounds and you, your goal is to weigh you know, 150 pounds. So happiness you know, is ex expectations over reality. So, so expectations are, oh, I'm not going to be happy till I have 150 pounds. That's my, you know, that's my goal. And reality is you're 500 pounds and you're not doing anything to lose weight. Well, your happiness is going to be very small. It's like it's 150 divided by 500 is almost, you know, like one between one third and one fourth. Right. So it's, not very high. Whereas let's say you have a financial goal and let's say your financial goal is to make a million dollars. Uh, and you actually have, uh, uh, you know, or, or let, let's, let's say, I don't know how to describe this. So essentially make sure that your expectations are not out of whack with reality. Right. And you could still, you could still say your goal is to be 150 pounds, but today my goal might be, this is where the process is important. It's not that the process or the journey is more important than the goal. They're equal. It's just that the goal and the journey are the same thing. So if your goal is to be 150 pounds, then your happiness is determined not by whether or not you're 150 pounds versus the reality of 500, but just today I, you know, did inter intermittent fasting. So I only ate, you know, a, a plate of vegetables for lunch and then a plate of vegetables a few hours later and boom, that, that was my, you know, chunk down your expectations so that they're, so that they could be favorable compared to your reality, uh, to, so that you're as happy as possible while you're achieving your goal. So this is very important. Like if, if I want to be a better chess player, I can't say, Oh, my goal is to be the world champion because there's no process that will make me the world champion chess player. That's not an achievable goal for me. And, you know, so this way I could be happy and just enjoy the game, even if I'm not the world champion, because, you know, I know that I will work hard and seek to improve today. And I, I have a set of things I do to improve. I could judge myself against that versus a final goal. Right. I could say, well, did I study my games that I played today? Did I study some classical games? Did I, uh, uh, you know, work on some puzzles that improve my calculation? Oh, I did all those things. Good. Now my expectations and reality are in line with each other. But isn't there like a saying that like always aim, aim higher than where you, you want it to be? Sure. So I can aim f higher, by the way, I, I, instead of aiming for a certain rank, I can aim to, to play 
higher than that, but the process will stay the, the same. If I focus mm -hmm. on the process, I'll be happy with the goal. So if my goal is to, to be, you know, again, I can't be world champion. That's ridiculous, but I can maybe aim for slightly higher than my goal. You know, my real goal for myself right now is to achieve a higher rank than I achieved when I was 25 years old. It's a long time ago. It was 30 years ago. And, uh, you know, that's achievable, but really what does it take to achieve that? And did I do that today? Am I respecting the goal? And as long as you're respecting the goal and you do the right things, you don't, you don't, you know, you, you treat your goal with respect. You don't just, I don't play just one minute chess all day long and then say, oh, I'm trying to get better because that wouldn't be respecting the goal. So my, my, my expectations won't be in line with my reality. But if I do the right kind of studying, I could expect, you know, high achievements. And then that's in line with reality is that, oh, if I, the reality is if I do these things, I will achieve my goal. I don't know. That one didn't make as much sense, but let's go with it anyway. <laughs> and then the final thing I want to talk about is creativity. So everything we've talked about involves creativity. Like Jay, let's take your example. Let's say you want to start your own audio studio. Right. Okay. Well, other people have started an audio studio. What are you going to do differently? Well, so like the one that I envisioned ideally, it's the combinations of a music studio, podcast studio, and a post-production studio. So it's like a, it's like a multi, multi, sort of like a multimedia studio. Um, and then what I would do, I would link all the room up and then I will have one room that large enough to have a live event. So people want to shoot something or people want to do like a live podcast or live show, they can do that and I can link all the room together uh, and create like a multi-room experience of recording and mixing. So I think that's a great idea. And what you did uses the, a creativity technique that I call idea sex, right. which is that you take two ideas and you combine them. Like, okay, you don't want to just do a music studio, but since you have all the equipment there, you could, it could be a music studio and a podcast studio. And if you want to throw in a third thing, you can, you also have everything set up to do live events. Like, so you get a big enough space that you could do live events. And the purpose of the live events is to not only make money through ticketing, but also so people are exposed to your studio. Yes. Exactly. And so this combination is very powerful creativity technique. Uh, let me talk about like some ways. And I wrote, I, I read about this also in skip the line. I call it the secrets of idea calculus, uh, which I talk about idea subtraction, idea multiplication, idea division. Um, but, and I talk about idea sex. So idea sex is what you did there was, you know, merging two ideas into one, or let's take, let's take, um, Harry Potter as an example. Let's say I want to write, I want to write something. Uh, let's say I really enjoyed Harry Potter and I really enjoyed the TV show friends and I want to make a new TV show. Well, I could have a bunch of wid wizards after they graduate from some sort of wizarding school. I'm, I'm not JK Rowling, so I can't use Hogwarts, but right. so I have a bunch of wizards who graduated from wizarding school and I put them in an expensive apartment in New York city. And while they're dealing with their daily lives of being wizards in New York city, they're also having relationship issues with their friends who live in the apartment or live in the apartment across the hall or whatever. So that's, you know, combining, you know, using idea sex to make a new TV show out of, out of the components of two things that I love, Harry Potter and the TV show friends. I actually hate the TV show friends, but how did the, how did SNL haven't done this already? I know that would be a great idea. Yeah. So, but I bet you that's how comedians do come up with ideas. I, I know this cause I've been a stand up comedian, like, oh, let's take Amazon reviews and combine it with satire. And there's all sorts of things you could find in Amazon reviews that are just insane. But, or, or, or look, music does this all the time with sampling. Like remember when the Fugees, we've had Wyclef Jean on the podcast from the right. Fugees. Remember when the Fugees did a rap version of the song, the disco song by the Bee Gees, Stayin' Alive. Right. That was such a, that was automatically going to be a bestseller. Like Stayin' Alive was the top disco song of all time. A rap, the Fugees was the top band at that time, 1996, 1997. Of course, a combination between the two was going to be a number one hit. So, and this, I would encourage people to listen to the song, We Trying to Stay Alive. It was a great song. Or think about Stan Weston. He wanted to make a doll for boys, but the only dolls out there were like Barbie dolls. So he made 
G.I. Joe. It's combined military, like all the boys like military stuff with Barbies and you had G.I. Joe. So that's combination is a very powerful technique. Another one is what I call idea subtraction. Idea subtraction might be take something, a good idea, like let's say you want to write a book and publish it and now subtract something from the, pro and, but then you say to yourself, well, I can't do it. Like it's five years before I write a book and get an agent and find an editor and get a publishing house and they have to publish it and so on. Well, let's subtract part of that process. Maybe you don't have to use a traditional publisher. Turns out self-publishing, paperback, hardcover, audiobook, Kindle on Amazon, on average makes people more money anyway than going through a traditional publisher. So 50 Shades of Grey, which was a horribly written book, was originally a self-published book and sold, you know, hundred million copies or whatever it was. So that I say horribly written book, but who am I to judge? Sold hundred million copies, more copies than I'll ever sell probably in my lifetime. So subtraction is often an effective way to get creative things done. Another thing is not subtraction, but substitution. So let's say I want to make, I loved Harry Potter, but I want to, I want to do, I want to write my, write my own version, but I can't write about a little boy with glasses who is sort of abused by his family who then discovers he's a wizard. Or can I? Because I don't know if we've ever talked about this before. You ever read The Books of Magic by Neil Gaiman? Uh, no, but I, did, I think I saw your post on Twitter. Yeah, so if you look at the cover of this comic book written in the early 90s by Neil Gaiman, who's a famous comic book writer and movie writer now, it looks exactly like Harry Potter and the plot is exactly like Harry Potter. I don't know if JK Rowling read the books of magic or maybe she read it and forgot it or heard about it, but it's the exact same concept as Harry Potter. So, but okay, for that aside, because you can do similar ideas over and over and over again, but that aside, let's just come up with some substitutions. What if Harry Potter's a girl instead of a boy? What if Harry Potter or, or your, what if the, your wizard is an old man versus a young, person what are what are other substitutions what if what if in, harry potter in space yeah what if it's harry potter yeah on on mars or what if harry potter's evil and Voldemort is good yeah you know, so i think there was uh there was something like that snickety lemony snicket was sort of like that or i don't know if that's a what about like the harry potter where he has to decide you know he's a good wizard but because he had cancer or whatever he has to find oh. some way to support the family so he has to become sort of like a wizard drug dealer or something oh yeah yeah what if there's a wizard who has to become a drug dealer to get because he's you know trying to raise money to get his mom cured from cancer or something like that yeah like great and that's like a little bit of combination a little bit of substitution or you could substitute or let's say adapt uh with the time so what if harry potter is not a wizard but is the same story, someone who's being, you know, verbally or physically abused by their family, sort of a geeky looking kid, but someone comes into him and says, Hey, you're a mutant. <laughs> like, you know, <laughs> professor X comes and says, you're a mutant. Or someone comes to him from some top secret organization and says, look, we genetically bred you to be a super scientist. Like you, we, if you go to our special school, science warts, <laughs> you'll be a super scientist, a, a phys the best physicist beyond Albert Einstein and everything, whatever it is. Like, oh, we're going to take you out of this bad situation that you're in because we realize you're the best, secretly the best investor in the world. And we're going to, you're going to study at our hedge fund and turn into the best investor in the world. So you kind of modify other things. Or I, I don't know if you remember when I did the Subway talk show. Yeah. So I took the format of a talk show, which is a late night comedian does some stand up and then sits behind a desk, has a musical act and interviews celebrities. So I took the set, the, the format of a late night show and I substituted, Hey, stage with subway. So I did stand up on a subway. I interviewed AJ Jacobs inside the subway. We had a musical act, which was this guy banging on trash cans and it was actually really good music. And I actually videotaped the whole thing and pitched it as a TV show, which was rejected. But that's when you substitute just one element of a very common format, it's a very potentially creative thing to do. So basically, even though creativity feels like it should be without rules, there are very common ways. And these are just a few of them, combine, substitute, subtract, 
Or another thing is adapt. Like, let's say I, I want to do friends, but I don't have a $70 million budget. Okay. Maybe I could do it on YouTube with my friends. So, you know, adapt to what you have, like, you know, set, set restrictions and boundaries on what you have. Robert Rodriguez, the movie director, he originally made movies in the early nineties. Now he's a huge movie director, but he did his first movie, El Mariachi for less than $20,000 because that was his budget and he couldn't spend more than that budget. So he made though a huge movie, it made millions of dollars for him and it started oh. launched his career by putting boundaries and restrictions around what he could do. So he eliminated things. Oh, we don't need to have 70 different camera angles. We don't need to have a million different settings where we film a little bit in the desert, a little bit in an apartment building, a little bit in the Super Bowl. Uh, we're just going to have one setting and, mm -hmm. and on and on. So he eliminated things that normally happen in movies to fit a movie within his restrictions, but he kept the arc of the hero. So these are some rules of decision-making around creativity. And uh, if people have questions, I'm happy to talk more about that. But Jay, this has been a long enough episode. I think we could probably divide this into two, don't you think? Uh, I think I, I think it would be great if people can just listen, you know, once through, you know, All so right. they can take notes and stuff like that, you know. And then if you want, they want to Good stop decision. and come back to it. Yeah. Good and decision. Then, and since it doesn't matter so much to me, whether it's one episode or two, and you're the expert, you're the producer of this podcast, I will you. bow to thank your decision you. and we'll do it as one episode. So I don't have to think about it anymore. <laughs> yeah, great decisions. Thank you, James, for, you know, Asking me to ignore my advice from my ex, 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 ex girlfriend. All the time. I will always be happy to recommend people ignore advice. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Ah, the sounds of the holiday. Ho, ho, ho. Because when you open a College Savings Iowa account, you're giving a child the gift of education to help pay for college and trade schools. You get a tax break and peace of mind for whatever's ahead. Register before December 31st, and you could be one of two lucky winners to get $5,290. College Savings Iowa. Sounds like success. Visit collegesavingsiowa.com today. Administered by the State Treasurer of Iowa. It's your last chance to check everything off your list at NFM. Get savings in every department. Shop in-stock gifts like toys, electronics, appliances, and furniture. NFM gift cards make amazing presents. Save time with drive through pickup. Get 30-month financing on qualifying appliance, TV, and audio purchases. And 24-month financing store-wide at NFM. Store closing early Christmas Eve and close Christmas. Visit NFM for your chance to win a Tesla Model Y. Minimum monthly payments required. 18% APR. Some exclusions apply. See store for details.